at 42 million. The art world, where paintings change hands for fortunes. So, thank you very much. But for every known masterpiece, there may be another still waiting to be discovered. This is it. International art dealer Philip Mould and I have teamed up to hunt for lost works by great artists. We use old-fashioned detective work and state-of-the-art science to get to the truth. Science can enable us to see beyond the human eye. Ta -da! Oh, wow! Every case is packed with surprise and intrigue. Is it or isn't it a Freud then? But not every painting is quite what it seems. Two artists rather than one. It's a journey that can end in joy. That is enough to support the conclusion that it is by Tom Roberts! <laughs> or bitter disappointment. I don't think it's a work by Gauguin. I'm very sorry. In this episode, two very rare portraits offer a glimpse into the lives of black Britons in the 18th and 19th centuries. There she is in all of her glory, not as a slave, but as something else. It's really important for our history. In an era when much of British industry relied on slavery, our pictures are exceptional in challenging the racist conventions of the time. The fact that we're dealing with fully finished high art work of black subjects, it's extraordinarily rare. But this is also a double whodunit. Can we identify the artist responsible and solve two separate families' mysteries? I just feel this is a riddle and it's, it's unfinished business. We actually don't have a clue who the artist is. Do the answers lie somewhere within this stately home? It's the same as our two girls. Could forensic tests reveal an unlikely new suspect? I mean, that's absolutely it's great. It's been, been staring us in the face the whole time. And is the evidence enough to convince a skeptical art world? Fake or Fortune often looks at works of art from all corners of the country. And today we're in Perthshire in Scotland. Have you got any Scottish blood, Fiona? Philip, how long have you known me? With a name like mine, Robert the Bruce. What do you think? Ah, uh, you've got the point there, Fiona. <laughs> God, you're doing your accents again. I don't know if I can bear it. Our first investigation in this episode is taking us to one of Britain's oldest stately homes, Schoon Palace. It has a rich history. The grounds of the palace were once home to the Stone of Schoon, the ancient tablet used to enthrone generations of Scottish kings. We're meeting the owner of this magnificent palace, Lady Mansfield. It's recently been revealed that a painting that's been in her family for over 200 years has been credited to the wrong artist. So she's asked us for help. Schoon Palace has a magnificent collection of art by some of the most accomplished portrait painters to have worked in Britain, including Ramsay, Van Loo and Van Dyck. But who painted the most famous portrait in the house is a mystery. And we keep the picture in here. Gosh, it's wonderful to see this in the flesh, isn't it? How beautiful. Just a lovely image, isn't it? Yeah. This is Lady Elizabeth Finch Hatton and her mixed race cousin, Dido Bell. They are thought to have been painted in the late 1770s or early 1780s, a time when Britain was still heavily engaged in the transatlantic slave trade. So the way it portrays the girls together is highly unusual. This is so important, this is so significant in the history of British portraiture. A black and white subject shown as equals in a formal setting. I mean, you wouldn't get an image of a black person and a white person together like this in Britain, at least until what? I don't know, the 1960s, something like that. So this was so ahead of its time. It's incredibly unusual. Dido Bell was born into slavery. She was the illegitimate daughter of John Lindsay, an officer in the Royal Navy. Her mother was a slave in the British West Indies. 
At the age of four, Dido Bell was brought to Britain by Lindsay and adopted by his uncle, William Murray, the first Lord Mansfield. It was Mansfield himself who commissioned the painting of his two great nieces. And for the current Lady Mansfield, this picture is very special, and she's hoping we can help solve its mystery. You married into this family. Absolutely. And this picture has become part of your history now. Yes, my children's history. Do you love it? Yes, I, I mean, we're all incredibly um, proud of it. If there was a fire, I would definitely be running into this room <laughs> and, and trying to get it off the wall. For over a century, this picture has been credited to Johann Zoffany, a German-born painter who specialised in both society portraits and theatrical subjects. But today, the art world is convinced that this attribution is not correct. It's pretty well confirmed that it's not Zoffany, but we actually don't have a clue who the artist is. Well, I mean, the, the, the problem is, you could say the excitement is, that there's a huge pool of possibilities. This is a great flowering moment in, in British portrait painting. And that's not the only thing, because the inscription says, the Lady Elizabeth Finch Hatton. There's no mention of Dido Bell at all. Absolutely. Well, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could not only add Bell's name, but the name of an artist on that label as well? That would be fantastic. This Who Done It could help our understanding of the lives of black Britons in a turbulent time in our history. But before we can start the investigation, there's another case we need to take a look at. So we're travelling an hour down the road to Edinburgh. We've been asked to look at a painting of two black sitters, which also challenges the conventions of the time. But it's only been in the family for a short while, and they know almost nothing about it. Hello. Hi. Hi. Come on in. Thank you. Owners Charlie and Sarah McQuaker have asked us for help to identify the artist who created their painting. This is so striking. It's so arresting. I love it. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. It looks to me that this painting dates from the mid-19th century, although I can't recall such a high-quality work from this period depicting two black sitters with such compassion. But the girls aren't named, and there's no title. So can Charlie give us any early clues? Where does it come from? Well, I got it from my uncle um, in France seven or eight years ago when he passed away, and it was a picture he always loved and uh, now I've got it, it's, it's in our family now. Why does it appeal to you so much? I love the, the expression on the girls' faces, just the, the serenity and the thoughtfulness and um, just the natural pose, it's beautiful. I just think the sheer quality of it just draws you in. Did your uncle tell you what it might represent or, or who indeed possibly did it? No. I've got a file of him trying to do some homework and research, but there's really nothing much on it at all. So I don't even know where he got it. Um, we don't know the subject, we don't know where they are, and we don't know the artist. So it is just a huge mystery. <laughs> <laughs> Not too much work for us, then. The palm trees suggest a tropical landscape, like the Caribbean, where slavery continued in the British colonies until 1834. So could these girls, in fact, be slaves? But if they are, why are they dressed in such fine clothes? The little girl on the right, she's almost trying to communicate something. There's something quite assertive about the way she's, she's trying to bring us into the picture. It's a very frank gaze, isn't it? It's like a challenge. Mm -hmm. Who am I? Mm -hmm. I need to take a closer look. Can I spot any early clues which could help us identify the mystery artist? The elder figure has her eyes upwards, almost like heavenwards. The younger one has her arm on her chest. And upon the elder girl's lap is a book, a thick book. Could be a Bible. So is this a painting with some sort of religious meaning? And I want to find out if Charlie's uncle discovered any useful leads which could help us. So did your uncle do some research then himself about them? He did. He found a small signature. There's a small signature which is not very clear. It's, it's hard to read it. 
I can make out an E and then what looks like a J-O-N. There seems to be three or four potential versions. He wrote a gentleman called Hugh Honor, who was a well-known art historian. Well, this is the, the response he gave. No painter named E, Jonias, Jonias, Jonxi, or Tonias, etc., appears in the largest 37-volume biographical dictionary of artists. Right, OK. So that sounds fairly exhaustive. The possible forms of the name suggest an Iberian, so Spanish, and to judge from the style, the picture may be Latin American. OK. So that's... Part of a lead. Mm. To the right of it is another word. It's the Latin word fecit, F-E-C-I-T. It's a fancy way of saying that it was painted by the person whose name is mentioned next to it. And, better still, there appears to be a date after that. Now, I can make out what I think is a 1-8. After that, I don't know, an 8 or a 3. Read as a whole, it seems to be an E-J-O-N who painted it in 18-something. It's a start. So in this episode, we need to identify the two artists responsible for these rare paintings. It's an intriguing double whodunit, so Philip and I are going to split up. First, I'm going to look into the famous portrait of Dido Bell and Lady Elizabeth. To start the investigation, I've come to Kenwood House near Hampstead Heath in London. Dido Bell and Lady Elizabeth lived here together with the Mansfield family, and it was in these grounds that they were placed by the artist. Whoever painted our portrait would have probably stood at the very place where I'm standing. He or she would have been familiar with everything around me here, this wonderful green pastoral setting into which Bell and Elizabeth, as friends, could sit. The bridge and that wonderful pink-lit London in the background. There are so few 18th century portraits where you can actually stand and dwell in the place that it was set. It's the presence of Dido Bell, a mixed race girl in an 18th century portrait of the aristocracy, which makes this painting so rare and important. I'm fascinated by her, and I'm not the only one. Director Amarasante made a feature film about her. I'm keen to find out about Bell's life here and why she's become such an important figure in black British history. So, Emma, what, what does this painting mean to you? Well, my original interest was to find out who we have been as people of colour going back in time and before the wind rush, before that, that ship arrived in 1947. And this is one example of that. There she is in all of her glory, not as a slave, not as we're used to seeing people of colour often in paintings, but as something else. So on the one hand it's a symbol and on the other hand it's, it's a door, it's a question, it's a whole set of questions. And what have you discovered in the process of making this film about Belle herself? I discovered the complexity of her predicament as a privileged woman of colour in the 18th century, growing up in Kenwood House, more wealthy than many white people, but not fully equal within her own family, and yet clearly very loved. While the girls were living here, the transatlantic slave trade was at its peak, so a friendship like theirs would have been highly unusual. The artist captures their close bond, but the props they hold reveal differences in their status within the family. Lady Elizabeth has a book, signalling she's educated, while Dido Bell has a bowl of fruit, firmly suggesting that she's seen as an exotic figure. She must have understood what her privilege was, and at the same time, she must have understood that there were many, many people who looked like her that were having extremely difficult lives at the time because of um, the, the slave trade and its ramifications. And while Dido Bell lived here, Lord Mansfield became an important figure in the legal debate about slavery. He was the country's top judge, 
and in 1783 made a landmark decision against the slave trade. Mansfield ruled against the owners of a slave ship, the Zong, whose captain threw over a hundred slaves into the sea in an attempt to claim compensation. Perhaps it's not surprising then that he took special care of Dido Bell, but it would have been far from safe for her to leave Kenwood House on her own. The reality of her life was that she had to be protected by her family. If she stepped out of the, her house alone, she could have been captured by slave catchers who wouldn't have thought for a minute about questioning who she was, who she belonged to, but would have um, zapped her away in a heartbeat. It's very interesting to know that when Lord Mansfield died, he left her in his will, her freedom. Um, the interesting thing was that she, he hadn't left her that prior to his death, and I imagine that was probably because she was safer under his protection um, and belonging to his family than she was simply having free papers. But then once, once he passed away, all he could leave her with, really, um, what were those papers and hope, hope that she would be safe. After Lord Mansfield died in 1793, Dido Bell left Kenwood House, married a Mr. Davinia, and had three children. She died in London in 1804, aged 42. Were it not for this picture, she probably would have been forgotten, but it remains one of the earliest positive portrayals of a black person in British art. There's something very free, confident, um, soft and easy about the way she she presents herself and for me that you know sort of finger on her cheek to me says I am here I existed you know and I'm very moved by that after Dido Bell died the painting remained here until 1922 when the Mansfield family sold the house and moved all their possessions to Schoon Palace so in order to search for clues as to the identity of the artist, I need to head back to Scotland. Meanwhile, I'm leading the investigation into Charlie's picture. I've arranged to bring the painting to London. Here, there are archives we can research and forensic tests we can carry out. But first, I'm meeting an expert in black portraiture. Can Professor Charmaine Nelson from Harvard University help me get closer to the artist? Charmaine, this is the first time you've seen the painting. What strikes you about it initially? So first of all, to have black sitters be the focal points is quite incredible. There's a whole tradition of black enslaved subjects being included in high art portraits where white people are at the center of the images. In those situations, the black enslaved subject is deliberately compositionally peripheral. They're on the outskirts of the scene and the portraits are not about them. Here, there's no one else but them. So this is extraordinary. So this suggests an artist who is doing something quite radical for the time. And Charmaine has also spotted some unusual stylistic traits in how the girls have been painted. The other thing that's extraordinary is the attempt by the artists to capture the deeply curled texture of African hair. A lot of artists in this period straighten the hair to make it look more like European hair. Also here, what's really dramatic and interesting is that there's a book. Because if we're dealing with a period of transatlantic slavery, uh, enslaved people were not allowed to learn to read and write. And I'm assuming because of the way she's looking heavenwards that this is a Bible. That would be my guess, too. For white sitters of high art, this is a standard trope of, I can read because I'm of a certain status. That's the same thing that this artist is bestowing upon this, the older female subject here. That's extraordinary. The details of the hair and book are remarkable, given that in 19th century Britain, black people were often portrayed as grotesque caricatures. But these stereotypes were being challenged by an increasingly popular campaign to abolish slavery. So could it be that our artist is connected to this political movement? The fact that these girls are being treated with dignity and respect, unlike so many of the caricatures we saw in the 
early 19th century. What do you think is happening here? Is this a message about the abolitionist movement? Is it simply an artist who happens to find painting mm -hmm. black sitters interesting? Mm -hmm. What do you think is happening? I think the rendering of the sitters and their intimacy, the, the use of the book and the implication that the, the one sitter, at least, if not both, are literate, is a decision on the part of the artist to elicit empathy or sympathy from the viewer. You know, to actually see them not as objects but as individuals, as human beings. That to me speaks to an abolitionist tendency, if not outright propaganda. So this painting is mm -hmm. Very significant and very rare, then. Absolutely. It's a very, very powerful, important painting. This artist clearly had a very radical view of how black people should be portrayed in art. This is increasingly becoming a political painting. And that, of course, to me, is really fascinating. Back in Scotland, I'm on the trail of who painted Dido Bell. At Schoon Palace, the Mansfield family has an extensive archive, so I'm keen to search for evidence here. Archivist Sarah Adams oversees the family's private papers, which date back to the late 1700s, when Dido Bell and the painting were at Kenwood House in London. She's been looking for any record of the painting. Sarah, thank you so much for burrowing through the archives. Now, what's the earliest reference to this picture? The earliest reference we managed to find was 1796. So that was just three years after Lord Mansfield died. And that's in an inventory. It's listed amongst some items in a room that's just called the ground floor at Kenwood. We can see the reference to the picture here. It says Lady Elizabeth and Mrs. Davinia. So that, okay, so, so Mrs. Davinia being Dido Bell's married name. That's her married name because at this point she was married. So this is definitely our painting, but there's no mention of an artist. And why is it without a frame? When we look at the other items that are in the room, it sounds like a bit of a muddle. There's other pictures, there's an old bathtub. Um, and then there's some broken musical instruments. So it would suggest that at this point, just three years after Lord Mansfield died, the painting was at Kenwood, but it was perhaps in storage. It feels almost as though it's been sidelined. Mm. So it sounds like the painting was no longer on display and with no effort made to attribute the work. And later records reveal that even more details about the painting have become lost in the passage of time. We can find the painting still at Kenwood uh, in an inventory which was made in 1904. Portrait of Lady Finch Hatton, seated in a garden with an open book and a negress attendant. So at this point, they, they didn't know who Dido was. I mean, what a chilling thought. I mean, Dido was one of the family. In the course of a century, she's just lost her identity. She's just become a sort of add-on, a decorative add-on in the picture. Mm, yeah, and in the 1910 inventory, she's not mentioned at all. It's just described as a portrait of Lady Elizabeth. No name. No name. How telling is it that although Lady Elizabeth remained identified, Dido Bell had been forgotten? But I've also asked Sarah to look into Lord Mansfield's private account books from the late 18th century, when he commissioned the painting. Did he record payments to any artists? Here we go. So we can see that in 1776, in October, he paid David Martin £200. David Martin, mm -hmm. the, the Scottish portrait painter? Yes. Born in 1737 in Fife, David Martin was a highly regarded artist, popular with the aristocracy. He studied under fellow Scot Alan Ramsay, and his painting of American politician Benjamin Franklin is on display in the White House. But sadly, Lord Mansfield doesn't record what he paid Martin for, so it doesn't tie him directly to the painting. And then a little bit later, in 1785, £105 pounds was paid to Joshua Reynolds. Joshua Reynolds, the, the president of the Royal Academy, the, mm. the towering figure of 18th century portraiture. 
But again, Mansfield doesn't record what he commissioned Joshua Reynolds for, so it doesn't connect him directly to the painting either. However, Reynolds did paint this unfinished portrait of a black British subject, Francis Barber, in or around 1770. Could this have inspired Mansfield to ask Reynolds to paint Dido Bell? We now have two prime suspects, Joshua Reynolds and David Martin. I need now to, to narrow this down further, to have a look at the stylistic evidence, see if I can pin one of these artists to our painting. Back in London, we've sent Charlie's picture to Aviva Bernstock, head of conservation at the Courtauld Institute, to run some forensic tests. We think the mystery artist was trying to make a political statement about slavery. Can we find any evidence to back this up? We're also keen to see if the missing letters from the signature and date can be revealed. Are we looking for a South American or Spanish name, as Charlie's uncle suspected? But first, Aviva wants to show us something surprising which has appeared under X-ray. So this is an X-ray of the painting, which I, mm -hmm. I did. Um, the X-rays are penetrating all the way through the painting. It actually mm -hmm. tells you the artist has decided to change the composition. So this is the artist working out yeah. what he or she is doing as they go along? Yes, yeah. The one thing that's, that's very clear here, I think, is that the position of this girl's arm has changed. So you can see several positions where it was. But I think her hands were actually in a V-shape. She was either holding a book or perhaps praying mm -hmm. at an earlier stage of the composition. This is a change in the tea dress worn by the left-hand uh, girl. But she and also I think the other girl were at an earlier stage wearing much more up-to-the-neck costumes. You can see here there's a, a costume which is higher. Uh, and then later on it was changed to a lower neckline, these really nice sort of tea dresses that they're both wearing. The changes revealed by the X-ray suggest the artist spent some time considering the style of the dresses the girls wore and the poses they struck. Given the negative attitudes to black people at the time, the care taken with this unusual portrayal strengthens our theory that it could be connected to the anti-slavery movement. And I also want to see what Aviva discovered when she put the signature and date under ultraviolet light. OK, so this is an uh, ultraviolet fluorescent image of the whole painting. The most exciting thing, of course, is the inscription, yes. which we can read much more clearly. Ah. OK, so now I think you can see very clearly. Charlie, can you read that? Because I can. If anything, it looks like E. Jones. Yeah, E. Jones. And then this is, is this, is this fake it? Yeah, it looks like it's, I read it as E. Jones. Feckett, and then there's a date which is very clearly uh, 1831. Whoa! So. It's interesting there's Jones because we were met exactly. on the wild goose chase and that it was, could have been Jonksy or, or there was this Latin American. Oh, yes, I wasn't yes. know how to pronounce those. <laughs> and it might just names. be Jones. That's a fantastic breakthrough, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, that's absolutely <laughs> great. It's been, been staring us in the face the whole time. It's got great work, Aviva. Thank you. A pleasure. Well, I think we've just had quite a breakthrough. We can forget all those strange John Yass, Hon Yass, I'm not even sure how to pronounce them. It's just plain old Jones. The artist is E. Jones. So now we need to find out who that is. Back at Scoon Palace, we're now looking at the two prime suspects, Joshua Reynolds and David Martin. We found evidence that they were working for Lord Mansfield at the time he commissioned the portrait of his great nieces, Dido Bell and Lady Elizabeth. There are several of their works here, so can I spot any with stylistic similarities? I'm starting in the dining room, where I find Joshua Reynolds's magnificent portrait of Lord Mansfield himself. Reynolds was in love with classical art. Often with his portraits, there's a craggy, statuesque quality, like sculpture that's, that's come to life. And one of the things that characterizes his work is the, is the intelligence 
with which he portrayed his subjects. This is a lawmaker. This is a man with compassion as well. I mean, it's highly sophisticated. One of his nicknames was Susploshua because of the violent expressive brush strokes that he was quite capable of with a big brush. And if you look at that cuff of the judge's cloak, you can see a whirlwind of activity, you know, the movement of the strokes. Now, our picture is good, but does it quite have that degree of complexity? I would argue probably not. Stylistically, and in terms of the approach to the subject, I don't think Reynolds is our man. I now need to see a work by David Martin. There are several of his paintings on display to the public here. There's one in particular I'm keen to examine. But it's kept in the Mansfield's private quarters in the family's drawing room. This is Lady Marjorie, painted by David Martin in the 1760s. I want to show Lady Mansfield what I think could be some promising clues. So, Sophie, this would have been done, I think, probably 10 years before Dido and Elizabeth. But there are characteristics which I think one can see with your two girls. That's so interesting. Now, what about the flowers in the hair? Absolutely spot on, flowers in the hair. Well, I mean, yes, of course, Marjorie might have liked flowers, but equally, portrait painters, I find, will sometimes impose their own ideas as to how someone should look. And I think that's what we're dealing with here. And flowers in the hair, a lovely bit of colour, catching the light, are something that clearly David Martin enjoys. Well, I definitely buy into that theory. Now, what about the clothes? That Indian sort of gauze is in the other picture. It is, isn't it? With, 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 that, with that beautiful gold embroidery. You see, one of Martin's party tricks was to allow one colour to shine through another. Not everyone could pull that one off. I think any opportunity to use it, and he's done it with Marjorie, and why shouldn't he be doing it with your double portrait? I'm also struck by the way Martin has composed his female subjects. Both Lady Marjorie and Lady Elizabeth have been painted with bright red ruby lips, almost luminous. And the heads of all three women have an elongated lozenge shape to them. And most obvious of all is the finger raised to the face, a gesture struck by both Lady Marjorie and Dido Bell. Gosh, why didn't I notice that before? Why haven't all these years I hadn't even clicked that the fabrics were so similar and um, the hand, and in fact, she's wearing pearls too, and big ones, just like Dido. Well, next, we need to take this further with forensics and see if it's the same hand in both pictures. We've always wanted to know who painted Dido and Elizabeth, and if we could find out, it would be um, a, a family goal. <laughs> Meanwhile, forensic tests have revealed a signature and date on Charlie's painting. But just who is the mysterious E. Jones? Back in London, we're keen to find out. So Charlie and I are on our way to the Royal Academy, Britain's oldest art school established in 1769. Mark Pomeroy oversees their unique archive, which lists every artist who has ever exhibited here. So we've asked him for help. Mark, I'm just wondering if you've got anything about an artist, E. Jones. The first place we could try is an index to the summer exhibitions of the Royal Academy. If E. Jones um, had any involvement with the Royal Academy, this is where it's going to be. Right. And hopefully there aren't too many E. Joneses. I know. Well, <laughs> oh, well. 250 years, there may be a few. <laughs> All right, OK, so... OK, Jones E. Well, that's easy architect, so let's assume it's not that one. There are eight artists named E. Jones who've exhibited at the Royal Academy. But we can rule some out immediately. They were either working in the wrong discipline or the wrong period. So let's narrow it down. We've got Jones, Miss E, 1833. Portrait of Monsieur Fauché of the King's Theatre. But Jones, Miss Emma, looks much more promising, yes. I would say. 
1832, girl going to market. 1833, Willie and his dog. 1834, childhood. These are the kind of paintings, portraits, genre painting, telling a story, like yours. And the right time. Mm. Unfortunately, there's nothing here that sounds like it could be Charlie's painting. But can Mark shed any more light on Emma Jones? This is a dictionary of artists published in 1874. So if we go to the Joneses. Jones Emma. Oh, Madame. Madame. Soyer, as it obviously is. Born in London, 1813. She's reputed to have drawn likenesses with great fidelity before the age of 13 years. Mm. She painted portraits and groups of children. Sounds right. So this biography reveals Emma Jones was born in London in 1813, which means she would have been just 18 if she painted Charlie's picture. And we now know she married and became Madame Soyer. It's so unusual to find a woman working from such a young age and exhibiting at the Royal Academy when the art world in the 19th century was dominated by men. When I saw the name E. Jones on Charlie's painting, it never occurred to me we might be looking at a female artist, because that's pretty rare. But I think she's looking very promising. Back in Scotland, at Scone Palace, we've called in specialist conservators from the University of Northumbria. We're searching for scientific evidence to connect David Martin to the picture of Dido Bell and Lady Elizabeth. The forensic experts are taking minute paint samples from both portraits, Lady Marjorie and Dido Bell and Lady Elizabeth. They are also using an XRF spectrometer to send X-rays to identify any common elements in the paintings. They'll be looking for any chemical link between the portraits. They need to process the results at their lab in Newcastle. So I'm heading back to London to catch up with Fiona, who has some news about Charlie's painting. I think I've found our painter. This is Emma Jones. This is a self-portrait, which is rather beautiful, isn't it? It was highly accomplished. I mean, the, the, the technique in the face, that stippling, is, is like a, a really professional miniaturist. Well, she was a child prodigy. So she exhibited at the Royal Academy, which as a woman was hard enough. But her first painting was hung there when she was 10, 10 years old. Now, how did she foster this mm -hmm prodigious talent that she had. Her stepfather was a Belgian artist, well-known artist called Francois Simoneau. So one assumes that she learned under his tutelage. She got it first hand? She did. She went to paint the portrait of a celebrity chef at the time, a Frenchman called Alexis Soyer. He saw her, they fell in love, and they married. This is Alexis Soyer's beast of a kitchen. I just love this it's picture. Like a factory, isn't it? I mean, look at the dude, all these people rushing around. He was famous in London at the time. He produced cookbooks, bottled sauces. Here he is showing people around his kitchen. And look in this corner here, in his kitchen, what do you see? <laughs> Food and art. Not just any art, these are Emma's paintings. Alexis was known for proudly displaying her work in his kitchen. I I don't think I can see ours, but there's some similar looking things. So where was this? This was just over the road at the Reform Club. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Just what? there. There. Right under your nose. All the time? All the time. What I need to do is find out whether the club still has any of the works there. I'd love to be able to get to grips with her style and compare it to ours. Well, the Reform Club is one of London's most prestigious clubs. It has a dress code, and this will not cut the mustard, I'm afraid. What do you take me for? I'm an art dealer. I have the clothes. Suited and booted, and hopefully up to Fiona's standards, I've arranged a visit to the Reform Club. Established in 1836, this grand club for private members was set up as an exclusive preserve for well-connected, a politically liberal elite gentleman.
the club have confirmed that they do still have one original work by Emma Jones. And, perhaps unsurprisingly, it's a painting she composed of her husband in 1841, the club's first ever chef. Can I spot any stylistic similarities to Charlie's painting? So here is Alexis Sawyer, looking, I have to say, every inch like what he is, the celebrity chef. In fact, he's pointing to his signature dish, breaded lamb cutlets, which are apparently still on the menu today, although they don't look hugely edible to me. When you get up close, there's something very thick and rich about the handling of the paint. This is not transparent and glazy. This is quite built up. The hands also quite robustly painted. I, I, I get a sort of memory of something rather similar um, with our two girls in, in that setting. I've also noticed that the painting has rather unusual measurements. It's 36 times 28 inches. I don't need to measure it. It's called the Kit Kat portrait. It's something that was developed in the early 18th century. It allowed a face and hands, a little bit else going on, and it was bigger than just your normal bust portrait, which is 30, 25. Now, by the mid 19th century, although it was used a little bit by some artists, this was becoming old fashioned. So it's something that's quite noticeable about this painting and it's the same as our two girls. Emma Jones married Alexis in 1837 and so has signed her name Sawyer on this portrait. But she's retained a distinctive trait which is also on Charlie's painting. Emma Sawyer Feckett. 1841, feck it, feck it. This is the same term that is used, this slightly anachronistic, old-fashioned term, used a lot in the 18th century, that we've got in our two girls. Feck it, he or she made it. This is a quirk, a quirk that we see in both works. I've discovered that many of Emma's paintings include children just like Charlie's picture. But she didn't name the subjects, like this scene titled An Old Woman and Spinning Wheel. This means it might be impossible to identify the girls in Charlie's picture. But I've also noticed that Emma seemed to favour intimate and sympathetic portrayals of those on the margins of Victorian society. So could she also have been a supporter of Britain's anti-slavery movement? In 1831, the date the picture was painted, the abolitionist campaign was at its peak. And its most vocal and radical supporters in Britain were women, who formed their own societies calling for the immediate end to slavery. To search for evidence of a connection to these political groups, Charlie and I are heading to King's College London. We're meeting historian Dr. Imuabong Umaren, who's been looking through the university's archive that holds records detailing the activities of women's anti-slavery societies. Can she help us link Emma Jones to the campaign to end slavery? When I first saw the painting on your wall, I thought, we've got these two black girls, nicely dressed, mm -hmm. with the book which we assume is the Bible. Yeah. Why are they dressed so finely? Why are they reading a book? Why? is one of the girls looking heavenward as a sign of her faith. Mm. What light can you shed on that? I think that really links into a really interesting organisation called the Lady Society for Promoting the Early Education of the Children of the Negroes. And this group's main goal was to spread Christianity in the Caribbean, but also to really promote um, and improve the education of enslaved children. Now they did this through sending clothes, money, books, in 1831, there's a report that talks about the kind of impact of clothes, of books, that I think really do pick up on some of the themes in the painting that we have. And it notes, for instance, the children's clothing and appearance had improved as a result of Europeans sending clothes to the Caribbean. To have witnessed their orderly behaviour, neat, civilised appearance and intelligent faces would have gratified their kind friends in Europe. Later on, the report notes the children were continually asking for more and more books. And I think the image itself, the children, the books, the ways in which they're so beautifully dressed is a reflection of what's going on in this report. I mean, that's 
fascinating, it's isn't it? I mean, uh, so at that particular time, it wouldn't have been completely extraordinary for children to be wearing such fine dresses or have books what would be now described as aid supplies yes, in definitely. a way. Definitely. And do we know if Emma Jones was involved directly in these groups? Unfortunately, we don't. We don't know directly if she was involved, but given her own um, experience of painting disenfranchised subjects, we can imagine that she attended perhaps some of these organisations' events. She had friends with people who also were directly linked to organisations such as this. I think that may have influenced her decision to paint the beautiful picture that she did. So that answers a few questions then, doesn't it? Oh, completely. This is just so brilliant, isn't it? It, 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 just, just, it brings a tenor. It really it's, does. But there are also so many layers to it that I hadn't oh, appreciated. That's so mm. interesting. Thank you so much. I think that feels like a breakthrough. Completely. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. This report was published in London in 1831, the very same year of Charlie's painting. So it seems that this is the most likely explanation for our picture an abolitionist work inspired by a campaign run by British women to send clothes and books to slaves in Britain's colonies. Just two years later, in 1833, Parliament finally passed an act abolishing slavery in the British Empire. But tragically, less than a decade later, in 1842, Emma Jones died in childbirth. She was just 29. After her death, her husband, Alexis Soyer, organised a charity exhibition of her works, with the proceeds going to help London's poor. It was a fitting tribute for a remarkable young artist. Meanwhile, the results from the tests from Scroon Palace have been processed at the University of Northumbria in Newcastle. So Lady Mansfield and I are on our way to find out if science could connect David Martin to one of the earliest and most important paintings of a black subject in British art. This could be a significant breakthrough. Martin is a leading figure in Scottish portraiture and some of his works are held in the National Portrait Gallery in Edinburgh. But will my hunch about Martin be backed up by the forensics to find out, we're meeting Dr. Kate Nicholson. So Kate, have you found anything that can give us comfort that they might be by the same artist? Well, we've done some comparisons and we're looking at a white sample taken from Lady Marjorie, which we know is by David Martin, and what the particular chemical makeup of it is. So we can see that the white pigment he used was lead white, and we can see a mixture of binding oils that are used to mix the paint. Okay, so there's binding oil is, 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 is what? What holds the pigment together and makes it into a paint. The pigment you would just buy is a powder. If we look at the sample taken from Elizabeth and Bell, it mirrors oh, perfectly. Goodness. That's extraordinary. It's like a copy. You know, just, you could just, it's absolutely extraordinary. If we look at the makeup of the binding oil itself, we can see the ratio used in both of these paintings is the same. So, so it's the same gravy, as it were. Same gravy, same sauce mix. That's exciting. The white paint used on both paintings is an exact match. But what have the tests revealed about those distinctive red lips I spotted on Lady Elizabeth and Lady Marjorie? We see this particular graph shows a steep rise and that says in Lady Marjorie's lips, the pigment used was vermilion. Compare Lady Marjorie to Lady Elizabeth. Not only do we see it's vermilion, but if we do further analysis, we see even down to the trace elements, the two are a match. I mean, the chances of those being different artists is pretty remote, let's face it. It's very slim. Sophie, that's a match. Yeah. It's extraordinary. I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary. I mean, there it all is in front of our eyes. So the forensic results back up our theory that David Martin composed this painting. But to secure a new official attribution, we'll have to convince the art authorities who will need to view all our evidence back at Scroon Palace. But first, Philip and I have returned to Edinburgh because I think I've made an important discovery about Charlie's painting. All the evidence so far has pointed to Emma Jones being our artist. 
from the signature to the stylistic similarities with her other work. And now we're here to share the final revelation with owners Charlie and Sarah. There could be no doubt about it. As you know, We Think Your Painting is by the artist Emma Jones. She married the celebrity chef, Alexis Soyer. He died in 1858. And after his death, there was a sale of paintings. And I believe there, I found your painting. Oh, wow. So let me show you. <laughs> And here, at number 96, two Negro children with a book. That's incredible. That's painful. Now, the, the title, clearly, in our times, is a very unattractive one. That's not a word we use anymore. But in those days, in Victorian society, that was a word they used freely. This, I believe, is your painting. Yes. And what I'm delighted to say is that we can add to that because the National Portrait Gallery in London has kindly furnished us with a letter. So this letter is a confirmation that they believe, after consideration, that this is by Emma Jones. I can't tell you how helpful that is. That's fantastic. So it's like a certificate of authenticity. Gosh, it's fantastic. Wonderful. This is, this is so exciting, really, because you've now got a fully attributed picture. Its value, I can easily see it being worth £60,000, probably more. Gosh, mm, wow. But let's just think what you have got. I mean, there are so many collections out there, museum collections in this country and abroad, who would love a painting that this represents. This is a double whammy. It's a female artist, which is rare, and it's a subject matter that we badly need in order to balance the, the, the social history content of collections. I have to say, for me, I found this one of the most fascinating journeys I've been on in Fake or Fortune. What I wanted to do was find out who the children are. That's where I've fallen short. Because when you look at all the other paintings here, head of a child, head of a gentleman, two children with rabbits, she didn't name. It's she a bit vague, them, isn't I'm it? I'm afraid. Yeah. But even though we don't know who these two girls are, what their names are, we have a sense now of the kind of lives they would have been living, the context in which they were living, and the message that Emma Jones was trying to get across. I find that the power of the female voice with the abolitionist uh, movement, you know, pre the suffragette movement, mm. I, I find that really, really interesting. It's been a fascinating process, and I think you've done tremendously well to to find this out. We couldn't have done it on our own. <laughs> but we still need to solve the mystery of who painted Dido Bell and Lady Elizabeth. So we're on our way back to Schoon Palace. The leading Scottish artist, David Martin, has emerged as our prime suspect. The case has become more than an intriguing family mystery. Because of the story of Dido Bell, a former slave who became a member of an aristocratic family, the painting is now a work of national importance. What agitates me about this picture is that it's so high profile, and therefore the stakes are so much higher. You know, and as we know, the art world can be so tough to convince. Well, today, we'll find out if we've done enough. We presented our evidence to Dr. Brian Allen, an expert in 18th century British portraiture. He's agreed to deliver an official verdict. But is our case compelling enough? Brian, it's the, it's the moment of truth. You've seen our dossier, you've considered our evidence. What's your verdict on the painting? Well, I'm entirely convinced that this is by David Martin. This seems entirely consistent with all elements of his style, and I, I feel really confident that we can say that uh, without doubt. Well, that's terrific. What do you think? That's very... <laughs> it's excellent. I, I know the family will be absolutely thrilled that we've found an artist at last. <laughs> and this is a picture you've always loved, isn't it, Lady Mansfield? But there's always been this mystery about it. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's my favourite. It's my favourite in the collection, and it's marvellous now that we've solved the mystery. So the mystery is resolved, 
Thank you very much. What was it about the painting that convinced you in particular? In particular for me, it's the way he paints silks and satins and muslins. He has a particular style that he learned at the feet of his teacher, Alan Ramsay, the, the great Scottish 18th century painter. And we can see the hallmark of his period of learning with Ramsay in this picture. I think. Now that we know that this is definitely by David Martin, how does that affect the value, would you say? It's enormously helpful to have a name. There are so many institutions worldwide and, and in this country who would love a painting like this. I mean, this is a groundbreaker. This is sociologically so significant. And it's also a picture that delivers visually. It's, it's a beautiful image. Yes, it is beautiful. I mean, I can see it being worth £600,000, probably more. So what are your plans then, Lady Mansfield? Um, to, to keep it here, to keep it here at the palace. It's a family heirloom. You know, we're really, really proud of it. It will be a lovely story to tell our visitors from all around the world, and we can show them some of the other David Martins we have here at the collection. And um, it's here to stay. And it's such an intimate, tender painting. I think when you think about the love that Lord Mansfield must have had to commission it, and now it now has a, a, a very different message. I think. It's, it's a message about two young girls, a message about equality, as well as Lord Mansfield's private feelings about his two great nieces. It's transformed it, I think. Yes. Totally. And now a new pluck can be made correctly attributing David Martin and also restoring Dido Bell's name. So we sold this intriguing double whodunit. But these investigations have become more than that. They've transported us into the extraordinary lives of black Britons in a difficult chapter in our history. These paintings show Britain at a crossroads. Slavery was dividing the nation, and these pictures are radical. And for me, they represent hope with intimate depictions of black Britons. And we've identified the two artists, the two British painters who made these remarkable images happen. We've given them back their status. And now, surely, they can be properly appreciated for the wonderful images that they are. If you think you have an undiscovered masterpiece or other precious object, contact us at bbc.co.uk slash fakeorfortune. fortune.